So the uh, this session is titled Impact of Links on the Community, Short Community uh -huh. Vignettes, and it will be started by uh, Dr. Rebecca Reis from FDA. I will be talking about predict tox knowledge environment, linking data to cardiotoxicity. Rebecca, please, whenever you're ready, unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes we can. Oh, yeah. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Becca Raz. I am a pharmacologist in the Division of Applied Regulatory Science at the Food and Drug Administration. And today I will be talking about PredictOx knowledge environment, linking data to cardiotoxicity. Here is my disclaimer. So for an outline today, I'll be going over regulatory science at the FDA, what it is, um, a little bit about some of the drug safety priorities at FDA, and a sampling of projects that currently fall into the regulatory science space at FDA. And then I'll be diving into PredictOx, which is a new project going on at FDA. I'll be going a little bit over the history, um, as well as the data integration and some of the research going on at PredictOx, as well as some of the applications for PredictOx, as well as the applications specifically at FDA, and the future direction. So what is regulatory science? So the way FDA defines it is really the science of developing new tools, standards, and approaches to assess the safety, efficacy, quality, and performance of FDA-regulated products. And FDA's vision is to advance regulatory science to speed innovation, improve regulatory science decision-making, and get products to people in need. And really, it's supposed to be a driving force as FDA works with diverse partners to protect and promote the health of our nation and the global community. So that's a really broad definition. Um, so we're really going to focus in on drug safety today. CEDAR actually releases an annual drug safety priorities report every year. And in 2019, the drug safety priorities and highlights that they really focused in on were an updated very dashboard, pharmacovigilance studies via social media, Sentinel and other real world evidence, as well as responses to public health crises via novel research and treatments. Now, the common theme here is really emerging technologies and tools. So with the advent of these new technologies, SDA is exploring innovative ways to identify and prevent safety issues. So a few of these ways are through predictive toxicology as well as proactive pharmacovigilance. Predictive toxicology is identifying risk using methods such as systems biology, stem cells, engineered tissues, and mathematical modeling. And FDA actually released a predictive toxicology roadmap a couple of years ago, I believe it was 2017, to help better guide people in developing predictive toxicology research as well as regulatory review efforts. Additionally, proactive phases. So the first one is pharmacological target modeling to predict adverse events. And the reason FDA is currently looking at this is because clinical trials do not always identify many serious events that ultimately lead to safety label changes. So what FDA is doing is they're looking at target adverse event analysis, which is a set of adverse events that are associated with a pharmacological target. So for example, we have a couple of drugs here, um, sumatriptan, bordeoxetine, and velazodone that are all associated with the target 5-HT1A. And they're also all associated with the adverse events you see in the box, myoclonus, myoclonus tremor, and hyperthermia. So these adverse events are then tied to the target, 5 h one a So if a new drug comes along, we don't know its adverse event profile, but we do know that it's associated with 5 h one a We would predict, based on the target adverse event profile, that it's going to be associated with these three adverse events, myoclonus, tremor, and hyperthermia. Additionally, FDA is investigating microphysiological systems. Um, you might know those better as organ on a chip. And these really straddle um, the, the space between like actual humans as well as the, the petri dish and cell culture. It's really trying to make those cell cultures more physiological relevant. So they are trying to, they, they have like these um, microfluidic circulation of media. They also have these specifically dedicated co co compartments to better mimic the organ system. 
And so these labs are actually evaluating the potential of these systems for use in drug development. Next, we have the Comprehensive In Vitro Proarrhythmia Assay, or CIPA. And the goal here is to develop a new in vitro paradigm for cardiac safety evaluation of new drugs that provides a more accurate and comprehensive mechanistic-based assessment of proarrhythmic potential. Essentially, they're trying to predict better drugs that might be causing um, arrhythmias, uh, especially torsade de pont, which is a very dangerous type of arrhythmia. And the current cardiac paradigm actually leads to a lot of false positives. So they're trying to identify um, all of these different steps. You see four steps here that might be able to identify with more accuracy and lead to less false positives, um, a, a better cardiac paradigm that can eliminate these QT prolonging drugs and the torsades prolonging drugs, but allow for the drugs that might normally be false positives to come to market if need be. So FDA is really leading applied research across all four components to develop and validate this novel re regulatory paradigm in collaboration with agencies around the world, multiple pu public-private partnerships, industry, and academia. So a new collaboration that is currently coming to light at FDA is PredictTalk, which is an integrative approach to the prediction of major adverse events associated with therapeutic agents. And PredictTalk actually uses, utilizes data from academia, industry, and publicly avail available databases. Creation and analysis of analysis and querying tools will allow data to be used for predictive toxicology. PredictTalk is actually an international public-private partnership. It's led by the Critical Path Institute and Mount Sinai, but it also has industry partners from Pfizer and Genentech, as well as government from FDA and NIH and Elixir over in Europe. The PredictTalk was actually started in 2012 by FDA's Daryl Abernathy, and his vision was to build an integrative platform via a public-private partnership to allow sharing of pre-competitive drug research and development data for drug safety analysis. So really, he was trying to identify um, better ways to bring drugs to patients, better ways to identify um, patient-level predictions, gain biological and mechanistic insights for these drugs so that drugs could ultimately be safer for patients. The pilot use case that was chosen was sunitinib from Pfizer and trastuzumab from Genentech. In 2019, FDA funded the development of the PredictTax Proof of Concept project to evaluate cardiotoxicity associated with tyrosine kinase inhibitors and monoclonal antibodies. And there were two main goals as part of this initial proof of concept. One was the development of the knowledge environment, which will contain clinical, preclinical, cellular, and molecular data. And the second is the development of the user interface and analysis platform. So this is going to contain statistical and network models to explore data and test hypotheses. So why did we choose PKIs and monoclonal antibodies? Many of these are actually effective cancer drugs, but they produce unanticipated cardiac effects. This includes left ventricular dysfunction, heart failure, QT prolongation, and the mechanisms for toxicity are poorly understood, and they differ between drugs, between patients, between dosages. So, for example, sunitinib actually has more than 50 known targets. So if we're able to better understand the similarities, the differences between all of the cardiotoxicities of these drugs, we can hopefully better predict the cardiotoxicity potential of these drugs as they're coming to market and even in post-marketing stage. So here's a schematic of the knowledge environment, which we've been calling a computational pipeline for cardiotoxicity. So typically, when we're looking at um, looking for adverse events. We have clinical trial data and pharmacovigilance and post-marketing adverse event data to look at. So we'll see in clinical trials or in the FDA adverse event reporting system that a drug might be associated with cardiotoxicity. However, now we will have in vitro, in vivo models, targets, biomarkers, things like that, that we can now associate with this clinical trial data, with this post-marketing data, in order to better predict cardiotoxicity. 
So we were able to identify these early signals of cardiotoxicity via this new in vitro and vivo data. So first, I'm going to talk about the integration of the cellular data. Now, this is done at the Drug Toxicity Signature Development Center at Mount Sinai. Um, so this is part of the LINCS consortium. And this is just a small part of what Mount Sinai is working on right now. So the transcriptomic assays can actually quantify changes in gene expression from FDA-approved drugs. And so they're currently performing these measurements and in induced pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes. They're looking at 47 drugs that are classified into multiple categories, but we do have our small molecules, um, our TKIs, as well as our monoclonal antibodies that we're looking at, as well as several other cardio, uh, cardiac associated drugs. So here's the schematic um, of what Mount Sinai is currently working on when they're looking at these IPSCs. Um, so six healthy human subject lines are being looked at to uh, investigate these 47 drugs. And we have three groups. We have a control group uh, for GMSO, TKIs and monoclonal antibodies, and other cardiac-related drugs. So per drug, per cell line, there was a list of differentially expressed genes, or DEGs, that was obtained. And we were able to obtain the expression in a few different ways. So the first way was to compare the gene expression and control versus treated as well as the absolute expression value in the treated cell line. So we'll go into this in a, in a minute, but you can see um, that we have the DEG, DEGs across here at the top, and then we're able to line up the disease-related genes here on the side, and we can see which, um, which drugs might be most associated with particular diseases. So you can see as an example here, drug one was highly associated with whatever disease was an example here, um, perhaps it was cardiotoxicity, and disease two, uh, or drug two, was not associated with um, whatever disease it was. So by identifying this overlap um, that we're getting from the disease networks and the cardiomyocytes, um, we can identify relationships to cardiotoxicity. So this, um, this information, from the, for the disease genes is coming from prior knowledge such as databases. We're also integrating pathway data. Um, so we're looking at multiple public databases that currently exist and contain protein and network information. This includes reactome, CAG, gene ontology. And appropriate data from these databases will be implemented into the knowledge environment to build gene and protein networks that are relevant to cardiotoxicity. These relevant genes will be identified from our cell line data, as I spoke about earlier, as well as from animal data. Next, we have the integration of clinical and preclinical data. So we do have a collaboration with Pfizer and Genentech to obtain all of the clinical and, uh, and preclinical data um, for trastuzumab and sunitinib. So this data was previously placed in Transmart, which is an open source data warehouse for storing research data and translational research. And the clinical data is currently in the process of being remapped to SDTM or study data tabulation model. And the non-clinical data is going to be remapped to the standard exchange of non-clinical data or SEND. Uh, finally, we're going to be developing a user interface so this is going to be a secure, user-friendly portal that's going to be developed to enable access to data to authorized users. And this is going to include data, um, some of the predictive models, references, user guides, FAQs, as well as training. And to assist with this design, an FDA PredictDocs advisory team has regularly provided input and feedback on this user interface. So this includes reviewers as well as researchers so it's very, um, it's able to be applied in many areas of FDI. Some of the challenges of Predicta um, really has been data. You can see data integration and data harmonization. So the data comes in different formats, uh, requires different levels of cleaning and curation because the data is coming from multiple different sources. So it really has been a big challenge to integrate all of this data together, have it all talk to each other, and be able to build 
a model all of, off of all of this data together. So that has really been the biggest challenge of Predict Talk so far. We are hoping to use um, Predict Talk in both regulatory review as well as research. As we spoke about earlier, the FDA's Predict Talk Toxicology Roadmap was uh, developed. You can see the schematic at the bottom. And one of their goals was to develop advances in tools and testing that can help products reach the market faster and reduce the need for animal testing. So PredictTag really addresses that because it can unite the in vitro, in vivo, and in silico approaches to toxicology, which will help improve the translation of these results and allow for prediction of serious adverse events during regulatory review and drug development. Additionally, we're very excited to use this in research. Um, we see a few different possible ways to use this in research. Um, we're hoping to, first of all, use existing models to help provide additional data to predict tax. Um, you can see over on the right, we have a microphysiological system as well as a QSAR system, which makes predictions based on chemical structure. So we could potentially generate some additional data using these models to go into uh, the existing predict tax or a future version of predict tax. Additionally, SEA could create new models um, if there are new um, requirements for some of the data to go into predict tax, um, we can work with the team in order to create uh, the, the models and the data required. Finally, uh, predict tax is a great resource for research. It's a very comprehensive database as of right now for um, cardiotoxicity. And so we would be able to go in and get the data that we might need in order for us to build some models for cardiotoxicity. So it could be a really great, really helpful resource for research. Uh, there are several potential collaboration opportunities with the Predict Talks team. After a seat by FDA, a panel of domain experts from industry, academia, and other stakeholders will be invited to provide feedback on the knowledge environment. And we're also actively recruiting new industry partners who might be interested in providing some preclinical or clinical data um, for predict talks, either this version or the next version. So if you're interested in collaborating, please contact Dr. Riley Iyengar or myself, and we'd be happy to connect you with the team. As far as future directions of predict talks, so first, once the FDA receives the predict talks model, we would have to actually evaluate some of the potential cardiac safety signals seen in predict talks version one. So it's going to be primarily applicable to monoclonal antibodies and TKI, since that's what's primarily going into the model. So we will be looking at some of the new um, monoclonal antibodies and TKIs that are coming under review to see if there are any cardiac safety signals that might be coming out, see if we can identify any of those early. Um, additionally, we'd be very interested in expanding this to other adverse events. So um, we'd be very interested in user feedback, um, as well as other stakeholders if they have any feedback. I'd like to acknowledge the whole team that's been working on Predict Apps. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this has been a public-private partnership um, across many different companies and um, associations. So I'd like to thank everybody from Mount Sinai and Critical Path for their leadership, um, as well as our collaborators at FDA, Pfizer, NIH, Genentech, and Elixir. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Dane Mayfield from University of Texas. Dane, if you have your slides ready, would you mind sharing them? Uh, Dane will be talking about identifying novel addiction treatment strategies using gene expression and links analysis. Please go ahead. Okay. So I want to thank the uh, organizers for the opportunity to talk today. This has been a, a really informative session. I've seen several of these before, and uh, this, this uh, program has really advanced over the years. So what I'm going to talk about today um, falls within the domain of brain disease and psychiatric disorders. And a couple of speakers have touched on this earlier today. And it's encouraging to see increasing numbers of papers come out that are utilizing Lynx L1000 CMAP data in some of their pipelines to develop therapeutics for psychiatric disorders. That was not necessarily the original intention of the program, um, but 
um, we found that there's a lot of useful information um, that we can utilize. So um, I'm going to I'm going to focus a lot on outcomes rather than how we did predictions. Uh, we've seen a lot about that today. So the, the the messages will be really on what are the behavioral outcomes of some of the the compounds that we are predicting. Um, that's that's really the the thing I think we're we're after here is can we can we get meaningful information from uh, from these these drug predictions that we're we're doing? So the work that I'm going to talk about is is largely uh, supported by the Integrated Neuroscience Initiative on Alcoholism. This is an NIAAA consortium uh, sponsored group of people across the the country. Okay, so. Why, why are we interested in alcohol use disorder? This is uh, clearly a psychiatric disorder, but um, alcohol use disorder comes at great cost and is very prevalent, not only in the United States, but around the world. As you can see from, from these plots, alcohol, drug, and tobacco use um, is highly prevalent um, across the country, and the cost to society is, is tremendous for uh, for both of these uh, addiction uh, domains. So there's a, there is an urgent need to study more about alcohol use disorder. And it's a complicated, it's a, this is a, um, a, a condition that is, is quite complicated. It's uh, composed of both genetic and environmental risk factors you can see here are some of the environmental factors that influence alcohol use are, of course, exposure, uh, early life stress, early um, alcohol initiation, peer groups, and a whole host of other um, environmental factors. And, and also there's a strong genetic component to alcohol use disorder. There have been a lot of large GWAS um, studies and, and twin studies as well that, that have demonstrated that alcohol uh, alcohol use disorder is heritable and is highly polygenic, which makes the disease very complicated to, to treat. And I think that um, that's indicated here. If you look at the timeline of FDA approved treatments or medications in the United States, there are, there are only three compounds. There are four, the uh, vitriol is uh, or Vivitrol is the uh, injectable form of naltrexone. But you can see it in, in the last 69 years, we only had a handful of medications that are approved for treating alcohol use. So there is clearly this urgent need to identify new drugs as treatments. And, and this is, I think, really hopefully gonna move along with some of the computational approaches that are now possible um, by including uh, some of the data from CMAP and the links. So, so the, the hypothesis that we're testing is really a very, a very straightforward hypothesis, and that is that gene expression data from both human alcoholic brain and different rodent road models of alcohol use disorder can predict drugs that will reduce alcohol consumption. Um, that's a very straightforward question, not so easy to answer. Um, but the approach we, that we use is to integrate gene expression signatures from these various models and those from the Lynx Ellen Bowson uh, database and use that to, to predict drugs that, um, that decrease alcohol intake. And so today I'll just touch on, on um, two broad uh, studies. One was the original proof of concept that, that's been published a few years ago. And then can we generalize um, these approaches to make drug predictions based on mouse drinking models rather than genetic models. The proof of concept uh, was performed in, um, in genetic models of animals that uh, were bred to selectively um, drink large amounts of alcohol. So this summarizes the, uh, the overall hypothesis. You've seen um, several, several uh, figures today with a similar outcome. We know that uh, that some condition like uh, um, addiction in this case produces gene expression patterns that are uh, that are very fixed and reproducible and that if we can identify expression patterns of some perturbagen that 
is anti-correlated with those patterns that theoretically will correct um, the uh, condition and normal levels of, of whatever's being measured will return. And, and so this, is, this, this has some simple and some really hard, hard parts to it. This, uh, this part of identifying gene expression patterns associated with addiction, with addiction is, is very easy. We know from uh, co-expression network analyses as well as some functional connectivity measures that, that um, alcohol use disorder produces a pattern of changes that are very distinct from those in normal individuals, and that's highly reproducible. We can measure easily um, the outcomes of different treatments. The, the hard thing to do is to determine whether the therapy that we've chosen based on a particular pattern of expression actually is anti-correlated. So that's uh, certainly a work in, in progress. So, so the, the basic steps uh, that we use, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of the computational uh, prediction part of this. We want to focus on the outcomes, but uh, we generally used uh, the KS statistic that was described originally by the Broad as an enrichment statistic to, um, to find our anti-correlated compounds. And we also use uh, correlation measures where we utilize the z-score level data from the, the L1000 and uh, correlated to some, uh, some measure of effect size, such as a t-statistic or a full change, to identify these anti-correlated patterns of, of gene expression. So these are two complementary approaches that we use in these studies. So the proof of concept um, study um, that I had mentioned is a, a, a good rodent model of binge drinking. This was a, a procedure that was developed by John Crabb at Oregon Health Sciences University. And again, these, these animals were selectively bred to achieve um, alcohol drinking that resulted in blood alcohol concentrations that are actually quite high. And what you see on this plot over generations of selection that animals that were selected for the highest drinkers did escalate drinking through these generations. And now um, these, these animals are at a point that they, they drink uh, very high levels of, of alcohol, definitely pharmacologically relevant concentrations of alcohol. So this was a model that we used originally to test. And so, so we, we did gene expression profiling in alcohol-naive animals. So these, these are the, the original um, outbred lines versus the select lines. And we utilize multiple brain regions for our expression patterns here. There are eight brain regions included that we know are, are important in mediating, mediating the effects of, of alcohol. And so, so those profiles were used to identify candidate drugs and ultimately test in vivo for drinking behaviors. And so, so the outcome of that, that test was that two drugs were, were identified that were highly anti-correlated with the input signatures from the, the brain transcriptome. And I should point out here that in this proof of concept study, we were not trying to identify drugs that would go immediately to some kind of human laboratory for testing. We, we used all of the compounds that were, that were available to us. And this was, this was only to identify the top ranked candidates, do they alter alcohol drinking? And so in the, on the behavioral side of the testing here, this was work done by Angela Osborne at uh, OHSU, where she, she tested a number of behavioral parameters. Most important for this, uh, for this talk um, will be alcohol intake and blood, level, blood alcohol levels. And so over the course of uh, three or four weekly sessions, uh, drinking intake was measured and other parameters such as water intake, saccharine consumption, locomotor activity, and uh, all of these are behaviors that are indicators of general sickness response or malaise. Those were also taken into account here. But uh, just for the, these two top compounds, teraic acid, which is a brutin kinase inhibitor that we would have never thought would, 
would impact um, alcohol drinking was highly effective in redu reducing not only alcohol intake, but reducing blood alcohol levels associated with, um, with, with alcohol drinking. And importantly, and it's data not shown on the slides, this didn't have any, any major effects on water or saccharin intake, nor did it have um, major effects on locomotor activities. So these decreases in consumption and blood alcohol were not um, associated with some kind of general um, sickness response. So, so the drug priority uh, part of all of this was done by Laura Ferguson, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time. She is now, uh, I'm sorry, a graduate student at the time. She is now a postdoc in Bob Messing's lab. She did the computational work and Angela did the uh, behavioral work. So, so to just summarize what I really just said is that you know, the question was, could we use naive brain from these, uh, these uh, select lines of animals to predict compounds that decrease alcohol consumption. And I think the, uh, it was a clear yes was the answer to the question for uh, both blood alcohol levels and alcohol consumption without major effects on uh, saccharin or water. But we wanted to move, we then wanted to move this, this forward somewhat and, and determine how generalizable these effects are. Can we utilize a whole host of different transcriptome measures that we had already collected from various, um, study, various studies of alcohol consumption? So these would be models with alcohol on board response, the, transcri the transcriptome response to animals that are treated with alcohol. And so, so here we, we consolidated information from a large number of studies that we have performed over the years where we had gene expression profiles with, that result in 86 different um, signatures. And, and so the goal was to do similar predictions uh, for drugs to, um, to, re to reduce drinking in this much more general set of data. So, so this resulted in uh, about 150,000 connectivity scores per expression profile, so times 86 profiles, and summarized across 2,600 connectivity scores. So this was a very data-rich um, analysis over all of these measures and, and summarized. Now, in this particular set of studies, we didn't leave the, the, the drugs that we're interested in wide open. Here we use the subset of repurposable drugs that are in the repurposing uh, database and links. And the big picture bottom line to this, <clears throat> if you look at across all of these measures um, of different compounds that were predicted by the, the links analysis, the green checks are positive outcomes, the red Xs are negative One, outcomes. And you can see that there was an overall 78% uh, success rate in a, a lot of these, these measures. There's a lot of caveats, but this, uh, this is a, a very strong indication that we are getting meaningful signals from these data. So, so the answer to the original hypothesis is yes, the L1000 data can be useful in predicting drug candidates. And it also brings uh, new challenges in future directions that we're currently working on. Uh, one, we need better high throughput behavioral screening. These alcohol uh, behaviors that I touched on are, are very long and time consuming and we need a more high throughput way to uh, screen animals because we have a real bottleneck with testing. Um, we also could, could use additional brain relevance um, cell lines. We've heard a, a lot about that today. Um, some things like uh, cell-specific uh, cancer cell lines from astrocytes, microglia, IPSCs, organelles, et cetera. These, uh, these kinds of data would be really uh, useful in some of our uh, predicted uh, strategies in the future. Also, um, including additional brain and psychiatric related compounds to the perturbogen list would be highly beneficial. We're working on that. Um, and then finally, utilizing uh, machine learning tools and single cell uh, transcriptomics to improve our input signatures. I don't think we're extracting all of the, the most meaningful biology from our, um, our transcriptome measures right now. 
and to show you just two little uh, pieces of, of that feature, uh, the features of <coughs> future directions uh, in collaboration with the Broad, we have added 60 alcohol relative, uh, 60 alcohol relevant perturbagens to the database, two neuronal based cell lines. These are neuroblastoma cell lines that have strong <coughs> dopam dopaminergic phenotypes multiple doses and time course uh, information consistent with the L1000 strategy. And, and these are in the therapeutics for alcohol, alcoholism and addiction, part of the data library. So that's been exciting. We hope we can, uh, can continue to add to that. And then um, earlier today, <clears throat> Ajay mentioned the, uh, the collaboration with commercial enterprises is is um, important and surprising somewhat, and 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 so we've been working with <clears throat> with um, a data analytics company in Cambridge uh, called Metrius Data Solutions. We submitted uh, an SBIR to develop some deep response models that we hope will um, identify new biology that we're missing for our input uh, strategies. But this collaboration we're hoping will will improve our predictive capabilities as well as develop uh, community resources, um, APIs that will integrate with some of these uh, deep response model tools as well as uh, with uh, linked CMAP data. And I uh, just wanna, I wanna point out um, the, the important players in all of this, uh, the Wagner Center for Alcohol and Addiction Research with Adrian Harris and Bob Messing as former and present directors. Uh, Laura Ferguson, who was a graduate student uh, with us and is now a postdoc in Bob Messing's lab. Sean Ferris, who was a postdoc here at the time, now at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he was um, highly involved in a lot of the, the computational and bioinformatics approaches for our drug development strategies. Yuri Bledinoff for uh, behavioral testing, Angela Osborne, John Crabb at Oregon Health Sciences for um, their help with the behavioral testing and genetic models. And of course, the, the team at the Broad Institute with Erevin, uh, Nick Lyons, who's no longer there, uh, Ted, and a number of other behind the scenes uh, Broad investigators that really helped us a lot in developing these projects. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dane. Um, <clears throat> so the last presentation has actually been canceled. The speaker will not be able to make it. So we can go through the Q&A session and uh, end, end a little early with the, with the understanding that the next uh, session, which are hands-on workshops, will start as planned at 4.25. Uh, so, uh, there are a few questions that have been uh, submitted uh, in the system. I can go through some of them. Uh, and for everybody else in the audience, please do uh, submit additional questions if you have them. Uh, the first question is for Rebecca. And it's a kind of multi-part question, so I will read it <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> Not to, not to mess anything up of trying to summarize. So how do you define the dose when the compound becomes toxic or trigger toxicity signature? As the first question, I'll read all three of them. Do different classes of drugs have the same mechanism of toxicity? And are there other projects similar to predict tox for other, uh, other organs like toxicity to liver, lung, or bone marrow cells? Thank you, and thank you for that question. Um, I'm actually going to start with the third part first. Um, so as far as other projects that are similar to PredictOx, um, as far as we know, we think that PredictOx is, is very unique. Um, the fact that it combines um, the whole drug development program for two different drugs from two different companies, um, it combines the cellular data, it combines the pathway data, it combines all of these different databases together. Um, we think it's a very unique project. Um, we don't know of, about any similar projects for any other organs. Um, 
and that's that's part of the reason why we're very interested in pursuing additional adverse events as well once we're done with version one for the cardiotoxicity. Um, as far as the, the same mechanisms of action for, for different drugs, um, we believe that, that the drugs might be causing um, cardiotoxicity by different mechanisms of actions, the TKIs um, and the, the monoclonal antibodies. They, they do hit a lot of the same targets, but there might be um, slight differences between them. Um, just because there are differences in the target profiles. Um, like I said, sunitinib hits 50 different targets or more. Um, so, and there's differences in, in patients, there's patient variability, there's dosage variability. Um, so we are very interested in kind of teasing out why some drugs and some drug classes cause cardiotoxicity and, and some do not. Um, so we're we do think that there might be some mechanistic differences between the drugs within the same drugs class and, and outside of the different drug classes as well. As far as the specifics um, on what Mount Sinai is, is doing, um, I did see Dr. Ravi Iyengar online. Um, I believe Dr. Eric Sobi is online as well. Um, they would probably be best equipped to answer that question. Um, I don't know if they're available to chime in. Yeah. Yeah, this is Ravi. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, there will definitely be toxicity when you increase the dosage. That's, that's, uh, that is sort of well known, right? But uh, the initial idea here is to assess for toxicity at therapeutic doses, which is doses that is, in this case, the dosage works really well for remission of the cancer. However, that very same dose in a subset of patients starts to cause uh, this, uh, um, uh, you know, cardiac dysfunction uh, and leading to heart failure, like in certain. So, uh, so if you reduce the dose further, pe people do do that. They, they take them off the drug when they come, uh, but that's not ideal. That's what is clinically done now. So, but if you reduce the doses much further, then there won't be any uh, therapeutic sort of effect of the drug. And so here it, the idea is to identify what the causes are uh, at the therapeutic dosage. At least that's the initial one. We can go to higher doses or lower doses and a different time regimens and all, eventually when we get a, for a format for this setup. Uh, thank you, Ravi, thank for you. coming thank in here. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, I guess I'm going to go just just in the order as they arrive. So the next question is uh, for Oscar about GANs and and does he see any use for uh, including graph convolutions uh, to generate new molecules? Uh, yeah, th that's a good question and. Yes, it's possible to combine uh, GANs with, with convolutional neural networks. There are some challenges on that, specifically in the, in the part of generating the molecule itself, because graphs are not, uh, it's not very easy to work with graphs. Uh, I think there is um, a paper from Nicola de Cao from University of Amsterdam, where they came with an idea of how to to generate graphs with GANs, I think it's called MOLGAN. So okay. if, if you have any, yeah, if you're curious, just check it out. Thank you, that's that's a great answer. So, so a more general uh, question for session speakers and I guess for uh, everybody else uh, on the panels uh, is the question of uh, basically what, what do you do when you don't think that any of the cell lines in links uh, are good models for what uh, what your problem is. And I know that there are different philosophies on this uh, and range from basically, yes, the, you know, the, once you perturb things, they may respond uh, in an adequate way, even if they are very different than, than the uh, than what you would want biological model to look like to the others that they basically consider them to be completely useless unless they are modeling the the disease very closely. So what do you guys think? 
in my opinion, I mean, uh, we have done an analysis again in Bayer. We, we did an analysis of comparing the predictions using different uh, cell lines. Uh, we came to the conclusion that choosing the right cell line is very, very important, specifically when you're looking for the activity on one target that may or may not be expressed in a cell line. On the other hand, it also depends on what you want to predict. There are general properties of, of or activities that can be predicted with any cell line. Like, I mean, if you have like a set of super toxic compounds and they just need to cross the, the membrane, if they cross, they might have the, the effect they're looking for. So yeah, for general uh, properties, I think you can use any cell line. If you are looking for activity on a specific target, yeah, choose the right cell line because that can completely change your, your results or predictions. Yeah, I, I would add to that. I don't think anyone would say that the cell context doesn't matter or that it's irrelevant. It's that it's just a, a degree of how far away from you is the model, uh, how far away is the model that you're, that you're using from the question you want to you want to ask. If it's miles away, it's probably a waste of uh, a waste of time. Um, but I think it's surprising how much you can learn by having something that is close. And what's the definition of close? You know, there's no real answer to that question. Well, I think another thing that Mario did, I don't know if this is a helpful thought, but that comes from Todd's work and before that and Joe Gray's really has to do with the concept of working on large scale panels of, of cell lines with varying genetics and, and varying growth conditions, right? And it's actually from the panel that you see the landscape of response. And, you know, this sort of older idea of one cell line is, or one mouse model is a perfect mimic of a human disease, I think is actually, I, I would argue, the wrong way to think about it. What you have to think is that there's variation in the human disease that is at least partially replicated in these preclinical models, right? Rather than that there's one that's a perfect avatar of the disease. And I think that at least is one way that links helps, right? And, and, and you get an entire panel and it's the similar rationale that leads people to use panels of PDXs, for example, or panels of gems, so. Uh, so this is Ravi. Uh, you know, I, I should say this, that it doesn't relate to our links project, but we use Todd's uh, links data to look for pathways to find a drug for aneurysm. And the criticism originally was, oh, those are all cancer cell lines. How can you, uh, how does this even work? Uh, as it turned out across the cell lines, when a certain drug uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, perturbs the same pathway in different contexts, and the same pathways also involved in this particular case, it turned out to be uh, sort of cytoskeletal and actin filament pathways is involved in, in, in your disease model, which is what we found from the transcriptomic data. Then matching up at the level of pathways became sort of a useful way to use the uh, gene expression data to sort of identify drug targets. So you can sort of, uh, if you want to uh, subtract out contextualization by looking at pathways, because the same pathways might manifest themselves functionally in different ways in different cell types, but nevertheless, they can be targeted by the same drug. So we published this in JCI Insight last year. So, so actually, Todd's database does work across <laughs> diseases and pathways. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I mean, the, the, I think the proof of concept that is obvious in these studies of, of uh, alcohol, alcoholic uh, usage. I mean, who would have guessed, right, that uh, uh, these cell lines would, would uh, predict good drugs for uh, brain modification due to the alcoholism? Uh, I, if you don't believe into this concept, right, that, that they provide a landscape of of responses that will be informative in in many different contexts, right? Then then it shouldn't work in these situations, and it does work. So uh, anyway, thank you uh, everybody for chiming in. I thought that was really that was really great. 
Um, the, the question for Dane about, uh, I guess, how far these predictions have been pushed so far, were there any studies in humans? Uh, and I guess that's, that's uh, to maybe uh, add to this is how, how far is clinic from what, what you've seen uh, so far in animal studies? These are uh, non-drugs, right? We have all the safety uh, data already. So uh, how hard would it be to push it all the way? Right. So that, that is a, a good question. And that is really a a common goal of the INEA consortium that I described in the beginning. We really want to use our animal model data to push drugs into the human laboratory. And um, to date, we have not, we have not done so um, because we, we really go through a lot of rigorous screening of the compounds that, <clears throat> that we're predicting. Uh, and we can only test the, the the very good candidates in a human setting. So we're not at that point yet. That is our goal, though, um, in all of this work. We want to get uh, novel compounds to human labs. How far how far are we on that? Um, that's 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 hard that's hard to determine. Um, you know, we could get lucky, and it would be a few years. Um, it, it's that's hard to predict. Uh, another question uh, for you, Dane, quickly. Uh, somebody's asking if you considered zebrafish assay for high throughput screening. I'm not quite sure uh, why would this be, but <laughs> you may know. Right. Yeah, well, yeah, we, we've considered a number of um, alternative models, whether, whether it's zebrafish or drosophila, but um, something that, that would be more high, uh, you know, high throughput. And, you know, the, that, that would be fine, but we, you know, those models become pretty far away from what we're after, and that is some a phenotype that's related to consumption, a voluntary consumption measure. And and so I think it was uh, Todd was mentioning earlier this this concept of how far you are from the question you're trying to to address. And so we do have to take that into account uh, when we when we establish uh, some of some of these models. So uh, yeah, we've we thought about zebrafish, and we're open to to ideas, um, but I, I don't know if we can train zebrafish to drink. <laughs> um, all right, I think I, I kind of went through the model, through the questions, open questions. Uh, so I have one question for Rebecca in terms of Predicom. How, what aspect of, of this knowledge base and the tools that you guys are developing, if any, will be pushed in the public domain? Uh, so far, it seems that uh, all will be uh, designed for a um, specific set of users, right? That will have to authenticate and so on. Is, is there some, some way to, to, to share this with the wider community? So I think for right now, um, the goal is really to get something over to FDA um, to evaluate it, to review it. Um, but I think ultimately, we would really like to, to share a lot of the, the models and the data um, that, is, that we're developing here. Um, we do have to be careful because some of the data is coming from Pfizer and from Genentech. So there is a lot of clinical trial data in there. There's a lot of preclinical data in there um, that is proprietary to um, the company, but ultimately, I think that we would really like to share a lot of what we we are developing with the public. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So there is one more question for Oscar. When you use generative model to obtain desired gene expression profile, specifically representing a specific drug effect, how can I know what is the minimal sample size for the training set? That's a good question. And um, my, my answer will be, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to know. Um, my advice, if you want to, to know if your data set is big enough, might could be uh, check 
that the reward, the prediction or the accuracy of the reward net, it's good enough. And apart from that, uh, working with a smaller, a small set just will limit the diversity of the compounds you will generate. I mean, if your reward net is working, uh, but still is, is a small data set, it will be just affecting the diversity of the compounds. All right, well, thank you. Um, these are all the questions I have. So uh, we will close this session as well and have a little bit longer break until uh, 4.25 when the next session starts, which is gonna be hands-on workshops and the poster session.